Coming up. Orbital ATK reveals a cislunar habitat. NASA observes a magnetic reconnection, and I explain what that is. I'm really glad he does. And we talk about planetary defense as our main topic. All that and more coming up on this episode of Tomorrow. Hello and welcome to Tomorrow, episode 9.18, here for May 21st, 2016. And before we get started with our show, we are going to go take a look at the patrons of Tomorrow, specifically these folks who are our Tomorrow Premier members. Now, these wonderful people, they have donated more than $10 per episode on Patreon for us. And we're very glad to have these people here. And they get access to everything, the whole Enceladus, if you will, uh, with what they get. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes. they get early access to After Dark, early access to the show, uh, Google Hangouts, uh, our Slack channel, our Citizens channel that we have on Slack. So you could see, uh, you, like this morning, you could have watched myself and Dutta and Space Mike like trying to figure out how Photoshop works and all those other fun things. Uh, hey, so I these, know how it works. <laughs> basically, you could have watched me try to figure out how Photoshop works uh, this morning on our Slack channel. So these Premiere members, they get access to everything. And we are so glad to have them on board with our show today. And of course, we give a big thank you to all of our Patreon patrons who will uh, no will note some of you a little bit later in the show as we go on. And if you would like to donate, you can go to patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. And now coming back to here, my name is Jared Head. I'm going to be your host for today because Ben is on the East Coast doing ITAR Redacted. So we cannot, uh, unfortunately, uh, say, uh, neither confirm nor deny uh, what Ben may be working on today. Of course, to my left, your right, if you're watching <laughs> on the air, or your left, if you're watching from the Southern Hemisphere, is the beautiful, the lovely, the talented, the not my wife, Carrie Ann. Carrie Ann, thanks for coming today. Yeah, thanks. I yeah. live here. Yeah, that's right. I just remembered <laughs> that. Uh, <laughs> Thanks for As I said us. that right now. Hey, thanks doing... for coming, Jared. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks. I don't <laughs> live here. Um, and, of course, just a little bit further to uh, your left, the right of the viewers, we've got Space Mike all the way from the mythical heated lands of Arizona. How you doing today, Mike? Pretty good. It's pretty hot here. <laughs> yeah, I would imagine. It's uh, it's actually kind of nice here in L.A. today. It's, it's like the first time we've seen the sun in a couple of weeks. You're so. right. Yeah, because it's been so weird. Well, why talk about the sun um, when we can actually talk about Can we go to the space? sun? So, oh, I wish. I wish. Yes. No, um, wouldn't recommend going to the sun. But let's go ahead and get the show started off with a rocket launch. And Space Mike, you're going to tell us about this rocket launch. That's right. We have a really awesome Chinese launch that actually took place last Sunday. Check out the footage. And this video is actually very short. This was a Long March 2D rocket that launched on Sunday, May 15th at 2.43 Coordinated Universal Time. And uh, this was from the Jiquan Space Center in northwest China. And this mission launched the Yaogan 30. Uh, uh, officially, it's a remote sensing satellite that will be used for experiments, land surveys, crop yields, uh, and disaster relief. Um, however, the spacecraft uh, reached an orbit uh, or a high point of about 653 kilometers and reached a low point of 625 kilometers. And it's in a sun-synchronous orbit due to the inclination that it's at. And what this means is, is a lot of people suspect that this is not just a reconnaissance satellite, but also an intelligence satellite or a spy satellite. And uh, as is kind of the custom with the uh, Chinese launches, whenever they don't announce a launch, it's usually a military launch. So uh, like all space hardware there, everything is dual purpose for both civilian and military purposes. So congratulations to China, and they'll be having some very very exciting launches coming up very soon later on. Yeah, and they're getting ready to do a whole new rocket and a whole new spaceport, if I remember correctly. Um, That's right. Coming up, so I'm very excited to see about that. So, woohoo, good for them. Now, uh, we're going to move. It's funny that the chat room was like, ah, yummy yellow smoke. Yes. Yeah, do not <laughs> breathe. <laughs> Big poison cloud. Yeah. Yeah. Just, we'll let that one go. Yeah. I always love those because I love seeing, I don't know, <laughs> I always think it's interesting nonetheless, but anyway. 
Go on, Jared. Yes. Um, <laughs> we're actually going to move from Earth to the outer solar system nice. because New Horizons is still going and it's still sending its data back, but Love it's it. but it has not stopped the science since after its Pluto encounter. It's actually continuing to do science while it's out there. And in fact, Perfect. this is a science image that's brought back to us of this Kuiper Belt Those would make the object. best socks ever. Yeah, look at that, isn't Can that great? Can we get that printed? So I think we should at Forever 21. Right. Um, now, uh, <laughs> this Kuiper Belt object has the wonderful name of 1994 JR1. Wow, what a great place. Um, it's approximately 135 kilometers wide and it's orbiting about five billion kilometers from the sun. Now the imagery here was taken by the Long Range Reconnaissance Imager instrument and uh, you can actually see the reflection of the primary mirror up in the top, uh, what's, what is that, top left. That, that top left uh, corner yeah, with the hole in it? Yeah, that's actually the reflection. It's not a UFO, don't worry. Uh, we're fine. Um, so I know the yeah, internet will now, Planet X. internet's yeah. gonna take that yes. and run with it uh, now. But there you go. Um, the, this image was specifically taken on April 7th and 8th at a distance of 111 million kilometers. Now they did uh, look at 1994 JR1 uh, back in November at a distance of 280 million kilometers. Combining the observation, they've now been able to triangulate the distance of 1994 JR1 to within 1,000 kilometers of accuracy. So its orbit has become even more accurate in now how they are studying it. So this rules out a previous hypothesis that it could have actually been like a quasi-moon of Pluto. And uh, that's very, very cool that they were able to do that. They've also used that imagery to find out that it has a very fast rotational period. It rotates once every five hours, 28 minutes. So that's uh, it's gonna make you a little dizzy um, if you're <laughs> out and on it. And of course, observing it keeps the operators and the spacecraft operations very sharp for their upcoming flyby of the aptly named Kuiper Belt Object 2014 MU69 on January 1st, 2019. So uh, <laughs> that's going to be great. As you can tell, the Kuiper Belt, just a wonderful place of great names uh, <laughs> out there. You know, it's just, it's like somebody wrote a beautiful novel and, and named everything. Uh, so, ben yeah, Credible in the chat room is wondering how many football fields that is. Uh, <laughs> And, and of course, the chat room, thankfully, is is adding uh, all their answers. I'm sure doing the math very quickly, where Mini Elon says it's probably 42, and Vax Hedrum adds it's 2.8 zillion. Yeah, uh, I think it's 2.8 zillion is yeah. the uh, correct terminology. <laughs> um, and uh, oh, you if guys. you want it in imperial units, you can figure it out yourself. There you go. So, yeah. So, oh, wow. very good stuff. Now, of course, we can bring it back from the outer solar system to somewhere a little bit closer. Space Mike, tell us about some plants that somebody has decided to talk about publicly. And that's, that's right. This is about some plans to develop a four-person habitat around the moon. And this is, in particular, Orbital ATK's proposal. And uh, we have a photo of their kind of early uh, initial design when uh, this was uh, uh, they were first contracted. This is a NASA program called Next Step, uh, which uh, they were selected for last year to study the initial version of a cislunar habitat that would evolve over time to a much larger research platform with many of the capabilities required, required for a human mission to Mars. And uh, for, for this study um, that's part of the Next Step program, um, it's kind of based on the same sort of public-private partnerships like the Commercial Crew and Commercial Cargo program. And uh, with this, they have lots of different uh, uh, um, ideas for how they'll be able to use this as a proving ground. And this picture is kind of misleading because it has Mars in the background, but we do have new photos of their kind of new uh, ideas for what this potential space station would look like. Much better, because the chat room is really freaking out. They're like, that's no moon! <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Mike, go yeah. on. Oh, no problem, no problem. <laughs> so the, th the cool thing about this is that NASA has goals of establishing a space station in either a stable lunar orbit or the innermost Earth-Moon Lagrange point to, to prove out several of the technologies needed for the trip to Mars, as well as to gain experience. So the chances of this public-private partnership achieving these goals is actually really high. And uh, something that I like about this is that um, uh, with their cislunar habitat proposal, it's built on, of course, their Cygnus spacecraft. And the pressurized cargo module is built by Tails Alenia Space, based in France. And judging by their different artist depictions, I'm assuming that Tails Alenia Space would build either the spherical node in, in the, the first uh, proposal, or that more kind of traditional node with multiple docking ports or berthing ports for station expansion and visiting space. Spacecraft. This is kind of an alternate configuration here with a, um, a kind of a, a longer route instead of a, doing a more modular approach. But uh, with this whole thing, uh, the part that law lawmakers liked the best 
asked about this was Orbital ATK's proposal relied heavily on the Space Launch System and Orion to deliver crews. And if selected, it would give Orion more near-term missions in cislunar space, aside from the test Orion shakedown cruises and the asteroid redirect mission, which we'll be talking about later, before being used for Mars missions in the 2030 to 2040 timeline. And in total, four companies, Lockheed Martin, Bigelow Aerospace, Boeing, and Orbital, K, Orbital ATK were selected to study these potential habitats. And all of them, except for Bigelow Aerospace, are a kind of subcontracting Tails Alenia Space for their pressurized modules, since they have the most experience in that, which I find really interesting. So uh, we'll hopefully get a lot more information as this program evolves over the years, and hopefully we will see a space station in lunar orbit somewhere. Nice. It's, yeah. it's funny, the chat room immediately looked at the first couple of, of uh, uh, pictures <laughs> there, and uh, Everyday Astronaut says, space kegs. Sir Gamelot says, yeah, those definitely look like beer kegs to me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and then uh, Harrison apparently was uh, taking up some uh, issues with the lack of windows, saying that uh, Harrison feels as though they would be claustrophobic without them. Uh, I can totally see that. And at the same time, like, what's the use of being stuck in a beer keg out in space if you can't see where you are? You might as well just be in a beer keg down on Earth, yes? <laughs> well, I mean, if you do have a beer keg in, in space and are imbibing from it, then it's not going to matter what you can see. Uh, but unless <laughs> yeah. you're inside of it, if you're stuck in a bunch of beer kegs, a series of beer kegs, if you will, much like a series of tubes, uh, it seems to me that you would want some <laughs> windows on that thing. So, Harrison, I'm with you on that one. Uh, oh, boy. Well, something yeah. that I find kind of interesting is that uh, um, both the Lockheed and Boeing proposal uh, proposes putting a cupola module, like the one that's on the International Space Station, on one of those uh, node modules. So that's because that everyone wants to drive the Millennium Falcon. You know that. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's all it is. It's just a ploy to make that happen. That's, that's so, so funny. It's Star Wars land in orbit. So, all right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Agreed. Yes. Well, talking about things that are happening in the area around Earth, there has been a very interesting discovery that has occurred uh, very recently with one of NASA's missions known as the Magnetospheric Multi multi-scale spacecraft mission or MMS. Totally easy to say. Which is so much easier to say than <laughs> the entire thing together. Um, now they fly through the invisible storm of particles that interact with the Earth's magnetic field, mm -hmm. um, both from the sun and from ex and, uh, um, interstellar, intergalactic sources, and all the other fun stuff that our magnetic field uh, interacts with. And uh, they specifically th flew through something called a magnetic reconnection. Um, now this mission is four spacecraft flying in formation to study the Earth's magnetic field. It looks super Star Trek. Yeah, it does look a bit Star Trek, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, now the magnetic reconnection is what occurs when two lines in a magnetic field realign with each other, connect, and then send jets of high energy high energy particles off. And this is actually one of the leading sources of space radiation. So that's why they really want to study this. Now, it flew through a magnetic reconnection on October 16th of last year, 2015. Now, they were taking data from the heart of the action there, and those instruments on board take data at a fast enough sampling rate that they were able to observe that magnetic reconnection in great detail, because it usually only happens in a matter of seconds. It's something that it's, it's woo, you know, it happens very, very uh, quickly. Um, now, the formation of the spacecraft that they're flying in uh, can be adjusted. It's in a pyramid shape, um, which clearly means it's the Illuminati uh, flying the spacecraft. But um, sure. the spacecraft, they can fly further apart to help view the paths of protons with their instruments, or they could fly closer to each other to help view the paths of electrons. And they were flying very close to each other when they went through their magnetic reconnection. And it turns out that they think, now that they've actually gotten data from one, that electrons are very, very important to that high energy uh, particles flying out during magnetic reconnections. So they're going to continue to do that. The spacecraft have flown through five magnetic reconnections since then, um, and they're going to continue to uh, go through that. It's already flown through the Earth's uh, boundary layer of its magnetic field about 4,000 times. So giving us some great data, especially in terms of what we need to know in terms of radiation and protection from radiation. <laughs> and speaking of that, of course, when you go to Mars, you got to think about radiation and protection of that. 
And Space Mike, you've got something about Mars to tell us about. It's a good segue. I like it. That's right. <laughs> yes, very good, very good. This is another proposal from Lockheed Martin, but this is not for their lunar base. This is something they're calling Mars Base. And we had a little bit of eye candy for you of their proposal. Um, <laughs> with this, they recently released a concept of how they would like to send humans to Mars by 2028. And uh, with this idea, it would be an orbiting science station that sets the stage for human landing missions in the 2030s. And uh, from the orbiting science stations around Mars, astronauts can perform real-time scientific exploration, analyze Martian rock and soil samples, and confirm the ideal place to land humans on the surface. Uh, we have an infographic that kind of shows a little bit more of, of its different uh, uh, subsystems. And uh, with this, it's especially being able to teleoperate rovers without a delay, I think is a good justification for this idea. Now, this plan would utilize the uh, Space Launch System and Orion capsule and would be built upon the habitats from their own Next Step program, which, as I said before, would be built by Tails Alenia Space, as well as they would have solar electric propulsion for this vehicle. Now, I don't know about those kind of large conical habitats uh, fr from their concept photo photos, but almost all of the other pieces of the station exist today. So this is something that they could do. Although this is just a concept, and uh, given Lockheed Martin's pattern of not really doing missions unless the government pays for it, this probably won't come about exactly like this. But it's still a good idea, and I, for one, am happy to see more missions for the Space Launch System in Orion, and seeing ambitious plans coming from space companies, even if it doesn't necessarily materialize in this way. The goal for NASA right now is to send humans to Mars in the 2030s, 2040s. So we will see some something, hopefully something like this, even if it's not Lockheed Martin's proposal. Yeah, still a very interesting proposal. And uh, I mean, even though, you know, we have the proposal from Lockheed Martin for Mars and the proposal from uh, Orbital ATK for the uh, Cislunar Habitat, it's good to have these proposals coming out because you, the more players Absolutely. you get in the game, the higher your chances are of actually succeeding in the game that you're trying to uh, you're trying to play. In this case, uh, interplanetary travel with humans, um, and and the more the merrier, I say, uh, with everything yeah. that we get out of it. So very very cool stuff. Well, ben Credible says uh, this does look nicer than the hashtag lunar keg, uh, <laughs> and Voforspace.com says they can get great orbital views of the five year anniversary party for SpaceX's Mars colony. Uh, which is just mean all the way around, but hilarious nonetheless. Uh, Icarus Factor, actually, to go back uh, to Jared's story, if you don't mind, was wondering if MM MMS found positions at the edge of the magnetosphere. Uh, oh, positrons. Oh, yeah. Yeah, which is a form, it's, it's antimatter. Gotcha. Um, I don't think they have yet. That would be a very big announcement to be made, and I don't believe that's been found yet. In fact, I'm not sure if the instrumentation on board of MMS actually can detect positrons. Um, but, you know, I'm probably wrong, and if I'm wrong, someone in the chat room uh, will definitely let me know about that. So, uh, <laughs> very cool with that. So Yeah, no, that's very cool. Yeah. Uh, ben Credible says, think Lockheed will start out-of-pocket missions now that other space companies like Boeing and SpaceX are sort of doing that? I mean, maybe. I mean, I guess there is a chance, but... But ITAR redacted, apparently. Yes. That was really bizarre. We completely lost Mike as soon as he said but and then static. <laughs> nope, who's still watching. no Mike. Oh so we will try to figure that out in a minute, which is hilarious considering yeah. that... Uh, oh, no, Jared, you've got the next story. So I guess we can just yeah. go ahead and continue with that. We'll just transition on into this <laughs> after no that little uh, ITAR redacted moment, which we're going to go to the International Space Station real quick and talk about some upcoming crew rotations. Perfect. Which is that... <laughs> The new crews for the upcoming International Space Station exp expeditions have been announced. Yay. And we are very happy to see that Alexander Gerst, who is a European Space Agency astronaut from Germany, will be embarking on a second mission to the International Space Station of May of 2018. And very, very happily, we are happy to say that he will take command of Expedition 57 on the station in September 2018. So he will become the first German spacecraft commander in history. And uh, that, is, that is awesome. That's really cool. So you've had an American, you've had a, uh, a Russian, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, I believe there was a Japanese astronaut. I, believe, I was just going to say, right? Uh, uh, his, name was, his name is escaping me at the moment. And, of course, um, uh, Chris Hadfield with uh, Canada. And now we've got... Dan uh, TC24 in the chat room says, first attractive beard. 
Yes, I know, right? Like, look, can we go back and look at him real quick again, Dada? Oh, that um, was hilarious. Because, because can we? Are we? Is it possible? Because I mean, if if the chat room likes his beard, we can continue to look at his beard. Yeah, look no, at that. that's. He's a volcanologist, by the way. He oh. actually studied volcanoes here on Earth. So, pretty cool stuff. And yeah, he's um, he's he's definitely not a sight for Zora. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to sit over here. And, All uh, right. Yeah, and we'll just... Uh, yes, Koichi Wakata, no? Yeah, there you Thank go, Koichi you Wakata. Thank you, Aspen, yes. in the chat room. Thank you so much. Perfect. Yes, he was the commander of the space station as well. So, very, very good. Excellent. Oh, yes, and Frank DeWin was Belgian as well, commander oh, yeah. of the International Space Station. Every, my gosh, this is why I love our chat room. If we don't know it, the chat room knows it, and the chat room lets us know it for sure. So it's fantastic. Oh, I love it. So, but we're very good. I'm sure Alexander was thrilled to hear that. Um, and uh, wunderbar for everybody. Uh, it's happening right there. So we are going to go ahead and take a break. And when we see do, if we can get Mike back, yeah, see if we can get Mike back. And when <laughs> we come back, we are going to be talking about our hashtag that we have: planetary defense. Is the Earth safe, and can we save it if there is something headed our way? As long so, as Bruce Willis is still alive. Yes. Oh, wait. I, oh, spoilers. Uh, anyways, <laughs> we will be right back after this quick break. And we're back. Glad to be back with everybody here <laughs> with just one launch coming up. Are you back, Space Mike? Yes. Can you guys hear me now? Yes, Yay! we can. Yay! Okay. Well, uh, I forgot to do this before we went to break, but uh, um, yeah, actually, let's go. Do, let's do the Patreon slates first before we go back into this. So, of course, we like to thank our patrons that contribute to our crowdfunding here at Tomorrow on Patreon. And now we are going to be thanking not just our premiere members who get to see their names multiple times throughout mm -hmm. the show. We also are going to thank our producers as well. Our Tomorrow producers, these are folks who have given anything from $5 to $9.99 per show. And you help crowdfund these shows. This is why we are able to do these shows, is because of your generosity and your awesomeness that you have thought that we are so good that you want to see more of these shows happen. And we are able to do that by allowing you to contribute crowdfund our shows at patreon.com slash tmro so a big salute to all of you on all of our patrons on patreon we're very glad that you contribute now uh I, this is what i forgot to do before the break which is that here in los angeles today external tank 94 is being moved from its uh i guess what would you call it the dock that they dropped it off at. Yeah, I suppose it was from, it was uh, yeah. set up in Marina Del Rey and now it's making its way through Los Angeles to get to the California Science Center. Yeah. Uh, so that's really exciting for all of us here. It's, yeah. uh, any it's... shuttle huggers know how we're feeling right about now. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have the picture of the two of you, but uh, from when the shuttle came through the city. Yes. Um, but uh, but you can imagine a gigantic mm -hmm. external tank. Yes. If you hit up any social media, Twitter, I'm sure you can see pictures and how completely ridiculous it looks yes. going through the city. Uh, but really, really cool. A lot of fun going on down there. A lot of people out there. My favorite shot was seeing it go over the bridge of the 405. Yes. Which for those of you who don't live in Los Angeles, the 405 is an infamous freeway that it will take you just... Prepare to camp. If it's you're a going major on the artery of Los Angeles, um, and it was so funny because I real I I mean you know you live in L.A. and all the traffic and everything, and you realize the external tank is probably moving faster than the people are on the 405 oh, right sad. now. So um, that's probably anyways, true. Yeah, and also there <laughs> there is a photo out there of myself uh, pre Mohawk. And Dada, uh, nice. well, when, we, when we both helped out on moving um, Endeavor back in 2012, I believe it was. So it was pretty cool stuff. And I should note that that photo was taken by uh, uh, Mars Rover driver Scott Maxwell. Nice. So, you know, there's some serious nerd cred yes. um, involved in that photo there. <laughs> but 
Why talk about serious nerd cred when we can talk about something that we need to do here on this planet? Something which even is more that serious. Something out there in space has our name on it. And okay, it's... as Ben likes to say though, space is trying to kill you. Yeah, that's that's the best way to put it. Space is trying to kill you. Um, and we kind of have to defend ourselves from something like that. Um, and you might remember the Chelyabinsk meteorite and all the other uh, fun things that have happened over the past couple of years that uh, have sort of uh, woken up people to the idea of, hmm, maybe we should do something to uh, try and prevent our extinction as a species, you know, um, just a little bit. Um, so there's lots of things that are actually on the table. And uh, one of those very instrumental and important things for planetary defense is going out and studying asteroids, um, especially in extremely close detail. Um, and that is where a mission like OSIRIS-REx, uh, which we will probably talk about a little bit later as it gets towards its launch date, um, but yesterday it was actually delivered to the Cape mm -hmm. um, to get in preparation for its launch in September of this year. And it's going to go out and it's actually going to reach an asteroid named Bennu, Bennu I believe. Um, hey, just like uh, I know, ben. it's Bennu. And I was like a yeah. little bit sad that it wasn't Bennu, but that's it's okay. It's going to go sample Ben um, yes. for us. <laughs> Very good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so we want to prevent Ben from hitting the Earth. Yes, um, we do. And uh, it, it's going to bring back those samples for us. Um, and there's other things as well. Space Mike, what are some of those other things uh, that we have to do for planetary defense? Well, something that I should mention is, is we've discovered, over, especially over just the past couple of years, that there are hundreds of thousands of near-Earth objects. And these range in size from you know, large asteroids that are extinction-level events if they hit the Earth to something small that would just burn up in the atmosphere and uh, possibly have kind of a violent explosion like in Chelyabinsk in Russia a couple of years ago. But uh, with this, ground observations obviously are very important to, to see if we can uh, find anything different. But there's lots of other spacecraft as well that are, that are monitoring the, uh, these types of things and going out. One of the big spacecrafts, my favorite, is WISE, now called NEO-WISE, which looks in the infrared spectrum and has been probably one of the biggest discoverers of a lot of these near-Earth asteroids and has kind of woken not just NASA but but even, even lawmakers up to the fact that this is a problem. We need yeah. to do something about this. So um, there's there's more spacecraft that are in the uh, that are uh, in various phases of, of construction that'll be launched to, in, in several years to look at more of these things and several other spacecraft that are going to be going to these asteroids and trying to figure out what the best way would be for us to move something out of the way. Now, uh, a really good idea that I like uh, is a uh, Boeing proposal, and uh, I think a lot of uh, general people would be able to get on board with this because this is kind of like an Armageddon style uh, <laughs> idea and with this they would send a spacecraft that would be loaded with missiles that would be <laughs> launched at an incoming near Earth asteroid to either blow it into pieces or depending on its size just nudge it a little bit to move it out of the way and uh, this is called their asteroid deflection mission and uh, is one of their proposals for a, a potential payload for the space launch system and uh, this is also built on the same type of satellite bus that it, NASA is working for, for for their asteroid redirect mission. And on the asteroid redirect mission, the plan is, is to send um, a spacecraft that is powered by solar electric propulsion to go to a near-Earth asteroid and remove just a boulder off of it. In fact, we actually have an animation of, uh, of NASA's plan to, uh, to do this, if, if, uh, if, we can, if we can roll that. And uh, with this animation, um, it shows kind of how they would, they would go about this. Originally, their plan was to go to a small asteroid and move the entire asteroid. But uh, the plan has since changed to just be able to have something that would, like I said, just remove a boulder off of the rock. And the really cool thing about this is they have developed something called a gravity tractor, which, no, is not a uh, technology from Star Trek. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's actually just a, a pretty simple uh, tr physics trick, I, I, I feel like. What they would do, which you'll see coming up in the animation in a moment, is once they have removed a, a, a pretty large sized boulder from this, the, the asteroid, it would enter into what's called a halo orbit um, in front of or in, it, really in, in, in any direction around this, this spacecraft. And this halo orbit, with the extra mass of the boulder that it would remove, plus the mass of the spacecraft, would be able to have a gravitational effect on the larger asteroid. And by having this mission go for several months or maybe even several years, they could be able to move a uh, potentially hazardous asteroid that could kill all of us and all life on this planet out of the way so that it would be, it would be safe. 
And uh, uh, the whole thing with this plan is this is kind of the only official missions that are booked for the space launch system. The robotic mission hasn't uh, uh, been been booked as so far as I know, but the missions to test out the Orion around the moon and then to send the Orion to go and recover this 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 boulder that has been extracted from the asteroid would take place. And uh, with that, this spacecraft, after it's done with the whole gravity tractor removal, or, or excuse me, maneuver, it would go into to uh, somewhere in stable orbit around the moon, or possibly even in one of the Lagrange points, so that astronauts could later meet up with that with that spacecraft and and take samples and and uh, uh, do any other sub type of science that they want to do from that. And I feel like this could potentially uh, pave the way for um, potential asteroid mining uh, techniques. And as you can see in the animation here, this is how they would do that halo orbit to be able to uh, slightly move the uh, larger asteroid to a, a safer trajectory. And um, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's a really good plan. I'm, I'm a big supporter of the uh, uh, NASA ARM mission, the Asteroid Redirect mission, and this is something that we absolutely have to do. If we do not protect the Earth from some of these potential asteroids, we could all be dead. And just one asteroid that I know of in particular, Apophis, still has the potential to kill all of us in the 2030s. So we have <laughs> to do something about this. The biggest problem I have with this animation, and it's like a four <laughs> or five minute thing, by the way, is they go down, they see Boulder, they grab the boulder they go away they kind of spin around for a little bit and then they like go over to Lagrange point like you were saying and then and this is the part I sort of have a problem with <laughs> they send astronauts from earth up to the unit that has the boulder mm -hmm. then astronauts have to do an EVA or an extra vehicle activity they have to get out of the <laughs> capsule yes. they have to climb aboard yes. then they have to take their own freaking samples and then they're going to pack that up neatly, nicely. They, they Literally, in the animation, they show them taping it down, uh -huh. <laughs> putting it into the thing, getting back into the capsule, and then coming back down to Earth, fiery, ablaze and everything, all the parachutes. They land, land, in the water. So we still got to go uh -huh. out and get them anyhow, which is awesome. Uh, I don't understand if this is just a freaking rock, why we can't just do that. I, under I get that whole idea, like, we don't want it burning up in our atmosphere and all that other fun stuff. But th then... Then we get it back onto onto land, uh -huh. and then we look at it for a while, and we sort of poke at it, and we try to figure things out, et cetera, et cetera. This is like a 10-year freaking process to like get this thing up there, over there, do the thing, get the stuff, come back over here, then send humans to it, and then send humans back down, and then other humans have to look at things and try to figure stuff out. I'm like, if we have a freaking asteroid coming at us, and I know things are not like Armageddon, but if we have an asteroid coming at us, and we know that in 10 years it might be dangerous. Mm -hmm. Shh. How did... There's not enough fudge room in that for me. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, I feel like... Your we margin to... of error is very small. Right, because yeah. then at that point, once we go, yeah, this could be dangerous, then what do we do? Because Bruce Willis, man, he's getting up there, okay? He's not going to be alive forever. We could be really screwed. Yeah. So I don't understand... Like, can somebody explain this? Explain this to me. <laughs> like, where, I don't, do you see my disconnection here? Yeah, I kind of see it where, where the idea of moving an asteroid doesn't seem like it's really going to do anything. Yeah. Okay, so Please? let's say that you have a spacecraft and you kind of go up to the asteroid and you've got, and once the spacecraft gets to the asteroid, there are six years until it hits the Earth. Sure. Okay, mm -hmm. is that a fair amount of time? You you just like uh, you can do the gravity tractor thing where you literally just park your spacecraft here right by the asteroid and because the asteroid wants and in the uh, gravity of the spacecraft interact with each other it pulls them closer to each other but the spacecraft you know it's got thrusters so it fires and it literally will pull the asteroid with the gravitational interaction. Okay, but so, if, if asteroid this big, <laughs> yes. spacecraft this big, yes. spacecraft be able to move if it can. <laughs> If okay, it, I'm trying to explain this. A, okay, go on. So yes, if, it, if does, it can. Let's say that it moves it, that after a couple of weeks, we've got it moving at one centimeter per second. Sure. Off, so we're going, we're going this fast. Right. Off from it. Uh-huh. One centimeter per second, does that sound very fast? No. Okay, but there's a lot of seconds <laughs> in a year, right? Sure. So if you've got six years of seconds, uh -huh. that's a really big distance that you get it to miss the Earth okay, by. thank you. So things are fine. Obviously, you would want to increase the speed at which you are uh, moving, you know, your asteroid out of the way. But that's, you know, there are other options if you don't want to 
um, do it that way, actually. Um, the, way, the way I've been able to make sense of it, and correct me if I'm wrong about this, but I feel like it's almost like tidal interactions, kind of in the same way as the moon is orbiting around us. It's, it's you know, pulling, pulling the waves and, and having interactions yeah, on us and everything. Since fair. it's in a halo orbit, it's not just parked in front of it moving, you know, doing some sort of tug of war. It's in a yeah. halo orbit. So as it's halo orbiting around it, or rather in front of it, those interactions as it's rotating are going to have an effect and, you know, move the boulder ever so slightly. And that's what's going to cause it to kind of wobble and follow it along as it's, <laughs> it's doing this whole maneuver. Okay, yeah. so then my next question is. Yes. So we so, move the asteroid. It's no longer a problem in theory. F fine. Uh, so then we do this weird sending humans to the place to get the sample thing, which I still think is really bizarre, but whatever. Okay. And we still are doing that because we want to know things about the asteroid that's no longer going to kill us? Potentially. Yeah, because I, I mean... It, oh, go for it, Mike. Uh, the way that I look at it, I mean, the robotic part of this mission makes total sense to me. You know, we need to protect the planet. The human part of it is just kind of like a cool science-y thing, but I think one of the big things that they would want to find out is whatever, for particular types of asteroids, we could mine them. You know, we could do, uh, harvest the water ice and convert that into rocket fuel. You know, we can use uh, uh, the materials if it's made out of a lot of silicates. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that we could do some sort of in pseudo resource utilizations to be able to make that a raw material that we could start doing 3D printing with. However, the question is with some of these potential asteroids that we're looking at is whether or not they'll even hold together. If we go up and barely poke it with something, is it all going to come apart in a big you know, uh, a pile of dust? Are we even going to be able to take samples off of it? Those are questions that need to be answered before we undertake any type of asteroid mining plans. And even though NASA isn't doing any sort, sort of asteroid mining, and at least as far as I know, there are lots of private companies that do have partnerships with NASA that mm -hmm. could see a lot of potential benefits of being able to mine asteroids. But that's a question that needs to be answered, but in my opinion, isn't a question that needs to be answered by humans, that could be answered by robots. Yeah, I think the human element involved in it is that if you, uh, the, the joke has always been in the inner circles of, of the industry and science and space science and other stuff, is that if you sent a geologist to the surface of Mars, it could do everything that has been done since the Viking landers up to Curiosity in 20 minutes. Um, so th <laughs> that's always been the joke um, with that. So I think the idea of sending humans is that you can send somebody um, to go like a geologist who knows exactly what you want to get from that sample as opposed to a robot, which is just going to have to assess what you're looking at and then figure out, okay, maybe I want to do this. Also. I think with the human element involved, you can bring a bigger payload back than you would with a, ro with, um, a robotic spacecraft. I think OSIRIS-REx is bringing back less than a kilogram of material from, uh, from the asteroid. And if I'm wrong, um, feel free to correct me. I think um, that is wrong. I think they're that. hoping to get as much as 4.4. Okay, yeah. Well, there you go. Um, a, a good they're, amount. You know, they, they um, can't guarantee that because of the way that... Uh, yeah, the design. Right, because that's collector. the one where the yes. like the arm goes down and then goes <laughs> and hopes that crap like yes, comes up into basically. the collection. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I know stuff works. sometimes. Yeah. Um, kind of like that Japanese mission where they hoped to get a lot of it and all they brought back was a speck of dust. Was that Hayabusa? It was Hayabusa. <laughs> yes. Um, still, speck of dust is a lot more than we had before. So uh, very important with that. And Hayabusa two, which is a mission that uh, that uh, the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency JAXA uh, has zipping. Around around uh, the inner solar system right now is on its way to intercept a asteroid. Um, it's going to drop a lander on that asteroid. It's also going to drop explosives um, on an asteroid to both detonate and take samples um, of the, ex the freshly exposed they, area. They learned a lot of uh, good, uh, they learned a lot from their mistakes. Yeah, Hayabusa. The, the Hayabusa mission is just riddled with problems. And the fact that they were even able to do anything and still get samples back awesome. from that mission is amazing. It, I mean, I feel like you can make a movie about that mission because there were so many problems with it, but they still were able to do a completely successful mission I go see the movie. Um, with it. So I just want to answer some things that yes, I see in please. the chat room, which is that Dan TC 24 has quite a few uh, questions about how you can do that orbit. <laughs> um, so has a halo orbit ever been demonstrated 
demonstrated? Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, we do them with spacecraft in orbit around the Earth. Um, like uh, Discover, uh, one of the missions that's currently doing space weather and other stuff, is doing a halo orbit around uh, one of the Lagrangian points between the Earth and the Sun. So uh, we have done that. Rosetta, uh, the European Space Agency spacecraft, is in a halo orbit around Comet churuyamov Gerasimenko, um, or nice. 67P, if you don't want to call it that. Um, so, yeah, you can do that. And those orbits are possible um, not because you need a high level of thrust. It's actually the opposite. Those orbits are possible simply because the gravitational pull from an asteroid is so minimal, you could literally just float there right out in front and nice. not have to really do much station keeping um, other than, you know, maybe I want to go down here this time. And in fact, a really cool thing um, that I learned from one of the scientists who works on Rosetta is that they don't really orbit the comet. Mm -hmm. They actually fly like these triangles around the comet. Huh. So they don't, they, you, they don't necessarily do a circular um, orbit around in, in terms of a halo orbit um, because that would use too much propellant. They literally just fly lines around in a, in a halo orbit, if you will, So, mm. um, which is pretty cool so yeah yes, halo orbit's definitely uh definitely possible all so. right nice yeah uh yeah there was a couple of, let's see yeah I d johnny Jer spacer does say that osiris rex is the coolest name for a spacecraft ever i agree yes it's pretty good although so, with the rex part, not I mean, even confirmed I, <clears throat> yeah <laughs> yeah i kind of here i want to look up um the actual the actual what it stands for because it's definitely oh, a back means? it's a backronym for sure Okay, you guys ready? Yes. Here we go. Ready to go. Osiris Rex stands for the Origins Spectral Interpretation Resource Identification Security Regolith Explorer. Nice. <laughs> Nice. At least, wow. At least the backronym is a cool name. Yeah, it still sounds <laughs> super true. cool. Um, yeah, and the planned launch for Osiris Rex, by the way, is September 8th on an Atlas V in the 411 configuration. So, uh, very interesting. Only one solid on it. And it will arrive at uh, Bennu in September of 2019. And then it will, as you just said, it will pull two kilograms um, up from the surface and its sample will return on September 2023 at the Utah Test and Training Range. Nice. Um, so where Stardust um, and Genesis dropped off their capsules uh, as well after that. So Yeah, so, they're hoping to uh, obtain between 2.1 ounces and 4.4 pounds. I apologize. Yeah, so, you know, could be a certain, uh, somewhere in between that. So, yeah, that'd be uh, really cool pretty cool stuff. Uh, now, there is the option, which is uh, Craig VG in here says, Jared, I just want to nuke it. Can we nuke it? Yes, we can. Um, if we absolutely must nuke it, uh, you can, you can, you can. Uh, NASA's actually done a study uh, where they, uh, where Mike, they did use Apophis uh, as a, uh, as sort of a uh, um, stand-in for a asteroid. Um, <laughs> But they assumed that it had a much lower density, um, and they assumed that it was on an orbital impact trajectory for the Earth in the year 2029 in this study. Mm -hmm. And they said that as long as you get out there sometime in the 2020s, and you can have six uh, nuclear weapons on board, um, and we're talking any, uh, somewhere in the range of about, um, let me see what it is right here, uh, somewhere in the range of approximately seven megatons of of nuclear capable explosive, um, I guess is the way to go. Uh, you should have enough energy to knock it out of the way um, with that there. So Something I, f I feel like I should mention too is that the whole reason why we're doing this whole thing of sending humans isn't just because they want something nice to do. This was the president's directive for NASA back in 2008 when he canceled the Constellation program going back to the moon for the yeah. purpose of going to asteroids. He didn't really talk about going to Mars. He said, yes, that'll be a nice eventual thing. But under my administration, we need to send humans to asteroids. And he even mentioned Apophis. He didn't say that the, we're going to go to Apophis. He said, like Apophis. He just used that as yes. an example of potential dangerous asteroids. So that's, that's the whole reason why this whole plan has come about, regardless of whether NASA wants to do it or not. Yeah, and uh, there, there, it's really important to do something like this, as the Chelyabinsk uh, uh, impactor showed us, mm. um, which is that just because you think you know where everything is doesn't mean that you actually know where everything is. Um, as the same, as we like to say up at Griffith Observatory, there's two things we like to say. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Um, uh, and also, uh, asteroids and comets are nature's way of saying, hey, humans, how's that space program coming along? <laughs> um, because, you know, unlike the dinosaurs, first of all, not only do we have longer arms, 
Um, we actually have the technology to prevent our extinction if we have enough time. Um, now, if we were to find something that was like two weeks away, like in Armageddon, um, yeah, I don't, I don't think all the time. What? <laughs> Which happens all the time. We discover objects that are like a week oh, out or two yeah. weeks out all the time. Absolutely. The past between like the Earth and the Moon. Most of them are just small little rocks. That that's yes. why we didn't see them before is because they're so small. But that happens all the time. Yeah. <laughs> <sighs> Scary. Times. It yeah, and, and you know, you don't necessarily have to um, to do the gravity tractor or blow up a nuclear bomb um, right next to uh, the asteroid. You could do a kinetic impact, so you literally just aim a spacecraft at the asteroid, put as much mass in that spacecraft as you can, get it as fast as go, going as fast as you can, and then boom, hit it um, and move it off course um, a little bit. And NASA got to demonstrate that with their deep impact mission. Um, where they had both an impactor and a flyby spacecraft that hit uh, uh, Comet Temple 1 um, to both study it and see if you could actually hit uh, a, a target very precisely. Um, so that was very cool. There's also the idea of like uh, focusing a laser beam down on the surface of an asteroid um, or focusing sunlight and generating uh, heat in a certain area where it vaporizes material off of the surface and that acts like a little thruster. And you know, over time, the little bit of thrust adds up to a very large distance um, moved away from it. So um, there's also ideas where you just basically like land a rocket engine <laughs> on the uh, asteroid and just light it up. Here we go. Mm. Um, so it's, uh, it's very cool that we have all of these options. It's just that we really need to test all of these options. Um, and that's especially uh, helpful for the asteroid redirect mission. Um, cause that's going to be nice. Cause you can see whether a gravity tractor really will work, um, which, you know, the physics says that it's going to work, uh, but it's always nice to just make sure, um, especially just in case something really is going to hit us. So, uh, very, very cool with that there. Yay. Yeah. All right. Very cool stuff. All right. I think we're done talking about planetary defense. So we're going to go ahead and go to a break. When we come back, comments from you guys from last week's show about Mars Nun, one, um, excuse me, and we will see you right after this short break. We've always looked to the stars. They guide us, give us comfort, help us find our way. We see ourselves out there. When we look up, it inspires us. And we long for something we don't yet know. We yearn to go there. So, we venture forth. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. It's one small step for man, one giant leap for man. The exploration of space will go ahead, whether we join in it or not. Many think we stopped exploring. But we know our journey didn't end. We've only just begun. Orion is functioning perfectly at this point. Come with us and explore tomorrow. Oh, that video always gets to be a little bit. Welcome back to the last segment of our show that we're having today. Oh, I mean, it really is an, an incredible video uh, that Ben put together. So, Ben, thank you so much. Makes me cry every All time. All the feels. I, I shed a tear every time. Not even once. Um, anyways, let's go back to our Patreon patrons because, of course, we always like to mention our Tomorrow premiere members. They get to be mentioned three times in the show, and of course they get access to all the goods because they've given us $10 or more 
per episode. And then we've also got our, our uh, Tomorrow Producers that we have as well. And these folks get mentioned two times in the show. And they have given us anywhere from $5 to $9.99 per show. And they get access to a whole bunch of fun stuff. We also have our Tomorrow, or excuse me, our Patreon Plus uh, subscribers that we have as well. These folks have given us anywhere from $2.50 to $4.99, and they get access to things like our Google Hangouts and uh, all the other fun goods that come with it. And if you don't have that kind of money, it's okay. We got you covered because we just have our Patreon patrons as well. As little as one penny gets your name on the show. So if you would like your name on the show, you can give us anywhere from a dollar to $2.49. That's all it takes in order for you to do that. And we are, of course, always so glad that you are willing to crowdfund this amazing show for us because, frankly, we can't do this show without you guys. Uh, bottom line, we just cannot do this show totally. without you. So it's always unbelievably appreciated. We are so thrilled that you think this is worth sharing to the world. And I've, I'm always just a loss for words as to what to say to all the amazing yeah. people who help crowdfund us. If you'd like to help crowdfund us, head on over to patreon.com slash TMRO, and we will be more than happy to take it there. So we're back. Uh, I, we, we talked about when Dada and I helped move the space shuttle, uh, space shuttle Endeavor through Los Angeles uh, back in 2012, and we talked about the, the missing photo. We have the photo. Here's the photo uh, that was taken. Oh, young uh, Jared, so yeah, cute. Yeah, look at me, so <laughs> young, so fresh, uh, so lacking in hair um, with it there. And then, of course, there's Dada on the right side. Just uh, above there. the Tomorrow logo, you can yes. see him. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, when you said a picture of the two of you, I was thinking, like, the picture of the two of you. This looks like Dada walked into your frame. Yeah, I yeah. know. <laughs> uh, it, kind of, it kind of is how it works, because Dada is, you know, behind the scenes um, with lots of things. So uh, it's it's pretty... I'm always uh, I think I think it's... <laughs> And of course, like I said, it was taken by Scott Maxwell, oh, who you awesome. can find him on Twitter at Mars Rover Driver, and he's he's quite prolific um, uh, in the circles of the spaceflight industry because he worked on Spirit um, and he did a daily blog about it, and I think he's still updating it with all of his stuff because uh, he kind of wrote everything down. It's it's an amazing blog if you ever get a chance to read it, so highly recommend it. But of course, let's go on to comments. Because we always like to hear from you uh -huh. about things like Asteroid Redirect. And in fact, as I should have said five minutes ago, don't forget to comment uh, and tell us how you would redirect an asteroid. Would you, would you use a gravity tractor? Would you use a nuclear bomb? Would you build a Taco Bell on the asteroid? And the inevitable consequences of eating that Taco Bell would That's help you really good idea. move it. Yeah, just figure it out somehow um, with that there. So, Capcom. Moving on to you. Yeah. Let's so, get a, let's get this started. <laughs> Last week we had on the mighty Ginge, uh, who is a Mars One. Uh, I almost said contestant, a uh, contender. I'm not sure what the word is. A contestant. One of the finalists. Finalist. <laughs> yeah, we'll go with that. Uh, He's gonna roll the wheel of Mars. I'm, I'm sure I'm gonna hear about it later. Anyway, uh, okay. with hashtag Mars None, and we had quite a few comments. Uh, of course, like always, most of them are coming off of YouTube, so I appreciate that. This first one comes from Martian Colonist off of YouTube saying, Josh is a fantastic ambassador for space exploration. The greatest impact of Mars One to date has been reminding the public of the allure of exploring the unknown. Inspired children, a new generation of scientists and engineers. Yes. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Totally agree with that. 100%. Yeah, uh, and it was great to have Josh on. I thought he was a really good uh, in interview, and uh, I, I really appreciate him taking his time out of his day. Yeah, that was great to have him on, too, because we had such a nice discussion um, about things, especially when he talked about going to see kids and telling them about uh, going to Mars and the process of it and getting yeah. kids inspired. Because I know when I was a kid, I was told that people would be on Mars by 2019, and, I'm, and that really inspired me as a kid to get involved in space flight. And of course, that's not happening, but still, all aside, it's still something that's very important, which is that if you want that future to occur, you have to help inspire that future in order to make that future actually happen. So uh, Space loss in the chat room saying Sp uh, Mars One hopeful. Yeah, I suppose that's that's a, also a good way yeah. of putting that. I really do hope that Mars One gets, gets it together and actually is able to do what they want to do, even if they're not first, even if they're like seventh or eighth 
Um, I'm from the camp of, of more, the more is merrier in terms of everything involved in spaceflight. So I really hope that they do have as much success as, as uh, we would hope them to have. So very cool stuff. All right, Capcom. Uh, yeah, Where actually. Where shall we go next? Yeah, so uh, this one also came off of YouTube. This was from James Harkness, the clueless DIYer that I sometimes have called Jack Harkness. I apologize. Uh, That's a compliment the, yes, amongst most circles. I know. Uh, and this, this the comment was actually in response to the last comment, but I wanted to include both of them because I liked what both of them said, uh, even individually. So James says, my sentiments exactly. He was honest about Mars One, and because of that, I actually have more respect. I have respect for them, whereas I previously did not. Great job, Ben, on getting him to come on. I really enjoyed the very in-depth and realistic conversation. Mars One should never shy away from doing interviews with Tomorrow. As every time they do, it seems they gain more respect from the community. Yeah, well, I believe one of the previous episodes, like way back, I don't know how many seasons ago, you yeah, guys interviewed... One, one, one or two, yeah, I mean, a couple, Something yeah. Something like that. <laughs> I don't remember either. A while ago, though. Yeah, a while ago. We'll just say uh, that. You had the uh, gentleman who founded Mars One, or the guy who's running uh, Mars Baz Luhrmann. One? Yeah, one Baz Luhrmann. Yeah, one of the guys, uh, you know, of, of course, associated with the Mars One um, activities from the very beginning, we'll yes. say. Uh, okay, that's a good way to phrase it. Yeah, so. no, so, I mean, I, I appreciate, uh, on behalf of tomorrow, I appreciate that you think that we're doing a, a good job with that, but I, yeah. I think, in general, uh, the Mars One people who have uh, taken the time to come on to tomorrow have uh, really given it some levity, I, I believe, so, uh, which is sort of nice. It's always nice to hear the, the honesty from it as well. So. Yeah, no, exactly. Very good. Exactly. So. You guys in general were really, really uh, nice and respectful, which I always, again, appreciate out of our entire community. So that was really cool to see. Yes. Um, yeah. Baz Lanthrop. What did I say? Baz. Did, did you I say, say Lerman? Yeah. Sorry, not did the guy you? who did uh, Moulin Rouge, although another Baz, really great guy, like him too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you to the chat room for correcting me wow, once that again. Wow, that was a good one. Um, Hey, it was the L, Baz L. Come on, you got to give that one to me. Mm. Yeah. Anyway. Huh. Anyways. <laughs> Moving right along. Now that we're totally confused, let's exactly. move right along. <laughs> this next, uh, next comment also comes out of YouTube from Smora. Uh, it says, too late, I'm taking apart my microwave oven now. No! no. <laughs> Don't! <laughs> Stop! <laughs> what are you doing? Oh Why goodness. would you do that? Why as, would you do that? As soon as I saw that, I was laughing so yeah, hard. Yeah, it's pretty good. That was good stuff. Yeah, that must have been a reference to our uh, our shows, our multiple shows that we've had on the EM drive, um, which uh, uses microwaves. <laughs> don't tear apart your microwave. It's dangerous. You could irradiate yourself. Um, just don't do it. I mean, we put it in all caps on the internet. I, That's how serious we I were. I think the only other thing, right, we're very serious. And we weren't yeah. trolling. No, right, serious. right. And we weren't we're trolling. Serious. I think the only uh, the only acceptable way of taking apart your microwave is in an office space style sort of smashing. Yes. If you will. Yeah, complete with the West Coast gangster rap behind you. Yes. With it. So okay. that's the only way to destroy things. Right. Honestly. So. I, I think so. In slow motion. Yes. <laughs> this, <laughs> this next comment comes off of Reddit, actually, from BZ922X. Let's see. It says, uh... Quote, you don't have to change your nationality. Space is the purview of all humankind. End quote. That was, of course, from Josh Richards from our interview. So that statement made me tear up. Thank you, Josh Richards. Yeah. Yeah, I thought that that was a great quote yeah. as well. We should probably put that on a t-shirt somewhere before he does so that we can still yeah. make money off of it before he does. <laughs> so, Josh, capitalize on the idea now before Carrie Ann Quick, does. copyright it. I just want everything on a t-shirt. It's like, that's just like my <laughs> shtick. <laughs> that's going to be okay, right? Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, my goodness. All right. And this last comment comes uh, again off of Reddit. This is one is from Brandon Mark. Uh, directed at Dada. Dada, this is for you. I fully support the new plan of using a different transition for each comment discussed. Probably should put it at the top. But either way, I still put it at the <laughs> Yeah! yeah! <laughs> there we go. And Ben just soiled himself. <laughs> that's the best part, isn't it? We can only get away well, with those things when he's not here. Yeah, that's, uh, of course, uh, uh, very good stuff. That's <laughs> anyway, as always, we enjoy reading every single one of your comments, concerns, complaints, um, no matter where you decide to put them, whether it be on Twitter, Tomorrow.TV, Patreon, YouTube, Facebook. Uh, I'm sure if you, if you comment, we're going to see it, because at some yes. point, it all filters through Reddit, uh, of course. 
I go back and I read the comments and I reply to some of the comments too from my own stuff. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Yeah, actually you guys have all been doing a really great job. I've, I've been sucking at it personally, okay. but uh, Ben has been doing a great job. Mike, Jared, even Lisa has been uh, responding to uh, your comments uh, wherever it is again that you guys leave yeah. them. So that's really great. We love ha bringing you into the conversation. It's so much fun. That's what I really love about the, uh, the show of tomorrow is our community that we have. You guys are awesome. Just so you know, you guys are awesome. You guys are so great. Oh, we love you guys. Massive feels. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Feel it right here. All of They're feels. all directed at you guys. Feel it right here and right here. <gasps> Anyways. That's a different thing. Yeah, that is. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's it for this week, yeah? Yes. Mike, you got anything else? One last uh, thing, the whole uh, Mars One thing. I mean, of course, I hope that they eventually are successful and their finalists do get to go to Mars. But if it's not successful, I feel like what my takeaway from from that show was that they are inspiring people, and especially people like Josh is doing a very good job of representing space, not just yes. Mars One. And if if it doesn't work, I hope that it just kind of goes away quietly, and there isn't a big like uh, controversy about it because that would just hurt more space and enthusiasm but but despite that th what they have accomplished up to this point is inspiring people and getting people who aren't already interested in space at least looking at it so yeah i feel like mars one is putting the money into studies um and studies are very important things to do especially with with uh, working with lockheed martin and you know maybe there might be something to do with uh, that announcement with lockheed martin trying to mars um at some point potentially so just, just I'm just going to throw that out there and let the internet run with it or something like that. So, um, I love yeah. it. Yeah. And I, just before we go off, I just want to say something because I totally screwed up last week and I'm going to say it right now, which is happy 81st anniversary to Griffith Observatory where I work at, um, opened on May, <laughs> just splashed myself yes! very good with my drink, May 14th, 1935. We've been in operation for over 81 years. We've had over 8 million people look through our telescope and it's just a joy to work there. And it's so amazing that we have been a public institution for astronomy for that long. Here's to you. And, uh, Thanks for the paychecks. <laughs> <laughs> I so. love it. So next week, Ben will be back. As far as I'm aware, I will be here. Mike, you'll be here. But Jared, you will not. Is that no, correct? No, I will not. I'm going to the Riverside Telescope Makers Astronomy Conference. So I will be up in the woods, in the dark woods, for an entire weekend of, stay, of sleeping through the day and staying up all night doing observations. Nature's so, just trying to kill you. I'm so excited about this. I will not get my Jeep stuck this time. So, now, Jared, will you be here the week after that? I will. Um, and uh, Carrie Ann, do you know if, if you and Ben will be here the week after? As far as I'm aware, yeah. Mikey. Because I'm possibly plotting on uh, coming over to uh, California so that we nice. can do a, uh, a show nice. with me actually in studio. I'll be in the same spot behind the counter over here, but you know. Oh yeah, no, we're definitely going to yeah. like throw you in we're the gonna, kitchen or something put or put you right there. behind. You can sit on the desk actually, is that okay? <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> yeah, I will not be here uh, the week after that, though, because I'll be going to LDRS, which is Large <sighs> Dangerous Rocket Ships. So I'm going to have so much fun. In fact, I, in fact, I just got my high power rocket this week. Um, which I would like to make the first rocket of spot, if that's OK with you guys. Fine so, by me. And I suppose I should bring it in two weeks from now so that we can all take we a look at it, it on the case. show. Yeah, everybody can sign you it and all that. Tomorrow's, uh, we, we need like a uh, um, uh, uh, tomorrow stickers or something yes. that we can uh, spray paint with. Uh, I, would like to, I would like to do that for the rocket. So that'd be pretty I'm cool. sure we can figure that out. Awesome. Yeah. Yay. All right. Well, thank you all for watching this week's episode. We'll see you next week. I won't. Goodbye. Bye. Thanks, everybody. And we talk about planetary defense as our main topic. All that and more coming up on this episode of Tomorrow. Because also, I hate it when he does that thing and he screams <laughs> at the camera and you don't understand what the hell he's saying and he's not Vince McMahon. It's so super annoying, seriously.